Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome aboard. It's another edition of Seven Geff Live. Paul Severino and Glenn Geffner with you. Uh, we've got John Shambi coming up, a longtime broadcaster. This is going to be fun. Uh, the uh, as I tweeted the other day, the the broadcasting nerd in me is uh, is probably going to get really obnoxious over the course of this conversation. Uh, but that's something to look forward to in just a couple of minutes. Geff, how are, how are you, pal? I'm doing very well. I had a new stove delivered this morning. There was chaos in the Geffner house last week. No stove in the midst of all this insanity, but uh, we're okay as of tonight. That's good. Looking forward to broiling again. Yeah, nice, nice. Baking. Yeah. all now. Yeah, and my wife's got a chipped tooth somehow. She has no idea how it happened. So, yeah, exactly. Just keep sprinkling these little hiccups in there, and it's, uh, it's fantastic. It's a lot of fun. Uh, we, uh, in terms of the show itself, and again, that's why you folks tune in, uh, we, uh, as we talked about last time, we're trying to expand our, uh, our media conglomerate here just a little bit, and Geff, we're working on that in, in other ways. We are the kings of all media now, officially. 7 Geff Live is now available in podcast form, and we're not yet on Apple, where just about everybody gets their podcast. It literally could happen at any moment, certainly the next day or two, but every other source you might get your podcasts, whether it's Spotify or Stitcher or Google, and at any point will be on Apple as well. You can hear all of the conversations we've done over the course of the last several months. We know that not everybody can sit down in front of their computer for an hour at a time and watch our show, so you can take us with you on a dog walk or on a long drive, wherever you're going. You're on the treadmill, whatever you're doing, you can listen to our conversations. They're all available now via podcast. Right, and if you take your dog out for a walk, please clean up after your dog as well. Sure. Um, a, uh, a message from the Marlins as well. Uh, Marlins fans, have you, as you noticed, we've been doing this last few shows. You can earn rewards points for every donation donation made to home plate meals home run rewards card holders enter the bonus code for this particular show of impact i m p a c t to earn rewards points and head to marlins.com slash impact uh, to make a difference so uh, so please take part in that uh we have again john sean coming up in uh, literally seconds here uh but we have our question of the day geff which kind of revolves around boog Oh, we went with the Boog angle. Boog called, as a Marlins radio voice, one of the greatest moments in Marlins franchise history. 12th inning, Game 4 of the 2003 World Series, the Alex Gonzalez walk-off home run. Remember, the Marlins trailed that series two games to one. They evened it up with that win, went on to win in six. They lose that game. They might not win that World Series. So with that in mind, our question of the day is, other than a championship-clinching moment, what is, in your opinion, the greatest moment in Marlins franchise history? All right. And uh, Boog might have had the call of it. We'll see. Uh, so send us your comments on that. I tweeted out the question today, and uh, we'll get some of your responses coming up. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Without any further ado or business to get to, we welcome in our guest, John Shambi, joins us right now. Boog, thanks a lot for taking the time. How are you? Good. How are you guys doing? I love that poll question. Can I vote? Absolutely. You can vote. Yeah. All right. So my vote would be... The first thing that comes to mind, I will tell you, there's a good nugget. You guys probably know this, but the division series in 03, game four ends on a play at the plate. That is the only postseason series ever to end on an out at home plate. That's wow. crazy. That's so that I, I Pudge holding onto the ball on the throw from Jeff Conine when, um, yeah, when Felipe Alou went with uh, an extra pitcher and didn't have a pinch runner for J.T. Snow. He wasn't able to score from second with two outs uh, on that base hit. Right. You know, if there's a silver lining to all of this, we've recently seen that game on TV again. We've heard yeah. it on the radio again. And we're being reminded of some of those facts. And some Man. more recent vintage Marlins fans are getting a taste of that history, which is really neat. Yeah. Yeah. DVH had a great call on that as well. So, yeah, that, that, would, be, that would certainly be one of my – one of my moments right there. I just I think of Pudge holding up the baseballs. C- cool moment. Yeah. How you guys make doing? bottle opener like your call of Alex. <laughs> Alex <laughs> That's fantastic. You're a bottle opener now. Now you've made it. Now you've yeah. made it. Uh, no, we are we are good. We are uh, we are missing baseball at least in terms of Major League Baseball. Uh, and, and trust us when we say that we're going to get into a lot of Marlin stuff along the way, a lot of broadcasting stuff along the way, kind of the nuts and bolts of of the craft. Um, but uh, in terms of folks that who want to watch baseball, they're getting a chance to listen to you nowadays because uh, with with ESPN covering some KBO games, you're you're up early, you're up late, you're you're actually broadcasting baseball games. What's that like? 
It's been interesting and so many, you know, people drop a, so what's the most difficult part of it? I mean, I'm not sure where I start. It's, it's, it's a, uh, it's, it's a really nice stew of difficulty is what I would say. <laughs> I mean, the start times, it's six games a week. The start times are 5.30 in the morning, four days a week, 4 a.m. one day, 1 a.m. another day. You know, for me, for the 5.30 games, I'm going to bed at 10, waking up at 2.30 or 3 and starting. I mean, I'm prepping the night before, but I still I want to get in there. You don't get lineups till maybe half hour before the start of the game. Our second game that I did, they called us 15 minutes to air and said, okay, so your game's been rained out. You're going to do a different game. And I was like, okay. 15 minutes um, before. Thankfully, it was the two teams that we had done the day before. So we, we survived with that. But it's it's just been different. And you're tired. You know, you're not – when you're doing the 1 a.m. or the 4 a.m., you know, doing these games, no matter what you want to say, at that time of day is challenging. And that's not even to get into all the technical stuff that's hard that I'm sure we'll, uh, we'll delve into. So what what is the what is the setup? Because I mean, when, when Glenn and I do a baseball game, we leave right. our house, we drive to the ballpark, we're sitting next to our partner, we're talking to people. Yeah. Are you doing these games from home? You're not sitting next to your partner. I mean, is it just off a right. monitor? How's the, how, what's the, in, that setup? I'm in my house. I'm in my office. They came and set it up, and I do the games. There is an iPad set up that's effectively the camera. I have an LED light. Um, I have an LED light um, that, you know, is sort of back here. And then there's a monitor right next to the camera that's 12 inches. And we get the feed of the Korean broadcast via Zoom call. And I have Eduardo in a little window above on the Zoom call that I can see him. And then I have my computer, I have a really big desk, uh, and I have a talk back box that has, you know, the ability I could, I can talk to Eduardo directly off the air, but it, it's, yeah, so that it's effectively, it's one monitor. So there's no ISO or anything right. else. It's, it's one look and, you know, I have my computer, you know, it's like, doing a game it you know to that extent only instead of the field in front of you it's the monitor that that has the game that's the the basic part of the setup and, and you're at the yeah. mercy and you're at the mercy of what they whoever they are yeah. in korea what that's they right. direct the shot so if you're talking about the manager yeah the manager either is on camera or you're hoping they cut to him you can't get your own director to, to cut to that no camera. you stay away from it right i mean every right. once in a while you know, they'll be wandering towards what we are. But if, you know, if they come back from break and we want to talk about the pitcher and they want to talk about a defensive play from the last inning, they're going to roll three right. replays from last inning and we have no idea it's coming. Right, right. And then sometimes they'll just show a shot in the dugout of a guy. And sometimes we know who it is and sometimes we don't. So, yeah, that's really the, you know, that's it. Plus we're delayed. Look, you, you know, you guys, at this point, people don't realize it, but you know the three of us understand. There's a nonverbal in broadcasting. None of what we do is scripted. Right. I mean, I, it, when we're doing the nine innings, there's nothing that's scripted. And so, if any of the two of us did a game together, there's just a a nonverbal and a way you use your voice that indicates. I'm finishing. I still have more to say. There's eye contact. All that stuff that gets thrown out the window. Plus, there's the technological part of it where Eduardo's on a, a bit of a delay. Um, yeah, all of it makes it makes it hard. And then, you know, again, you're calling it off of the monitor. So, if you really wanted me to do sharp play-by-play, -play, for example, I had this happen the other day where. You know, you're locked in on it and swing at a bouncer to third or to short. You know what I mean? Because it looked <laughs> right. like it was going it looked like it was going to third, but the shortstop made the play in the hole. So whatever. But it's it's just everything and it's it's probably a lot of inside baseball stuff that fans don't realize, but 
there's so much stuff happening. And then the other component is uh, June Lee, who is a really good writer for ESPN.com, is Korean-born. Um, he speaks a, a bit of Korean. He certainly knows pronunciation, so he's helped me with that. If I'm reading it, I'm pretty good. I mean, I, I would say I'm I'm decent. But you need to be able to to read it. And we don't – I need to get the lineups down when there are changes – I need to have it, you know, texted to me or, or put in front of me just because I'm still broadcasting the game as right. you're giving me the changes. And it's it's just a lot. It's a lot. It's you know, I jokingly say it's like, you know, you're you're log rolling for three and a half hours. That's how it feels. Log rolling and occasionally log rolling and juggling chainsaws. Jeez. It's amazing. You should have been doing the Dodgers and Mets at City Field this Sunday night on ESPN radio. Yeah. I'm looking at the schedule. Instead, your last game was the Doosan Bears and SK Wyverns. And I watched you, and it really is amazing because you look at how it feels like baseball, Major League Baseball, has become a much more local sport where people yes. watch and support their home team. And as great as Red Sox fans are, as great as Cardinals fans are, if their team's not in the World Series, they're probably not going to watch the World Series. That's the reality of Major League Baseball in the yep. year 2020. So you wonder, how are people going to flip over to ESPN2 in the middle of the night on the DVR and watch Korean baseball? But what you guys are doing is you're making so much more of a production out of it. It's not simply the game. And I think that's important for people to understand. There's certainly some entertainment value to what you're doing. We're trying. I mean, again, I, I we couldn't technically execute what – a fan who, may, if there's somebody out there who's a Dinos fan and a and a, and a Wyverns fan, I'm sorry, but we're not going to give you straight nine of just nuts and bolts. I mean, I do think it's interesting when they're upset that we're talking about something. You know, it's a difference between TV and radio. I'm not quite sure. Every once in a while, you get the complaint of, you know, he didn't call the pitch. Well, you can see it. Yeah. You know, I didn't call the ground out to second. I, and so I, we're, I'm, pro I'm probably doing a little less of that. I look at it as this is our baseball window. So this is going to be the space where we're going to update people on the labor negotiations. Um, you know, that it's I'm never going to make fun of it, what's happening on the field or the names. But I am going to mock the absurdity of, hey, it's 4.30 in the morning and I'm doing Korean baseball. Like, <laughs> right. I'm sorry. I am. I'm going to do that. And and we're going to and, and smile, everybody. And I put stupid pictures over my head. It's got a very Marlins bent to it. So I have ridiculous pictures of Mike Lowell and Derek Lee and Kevin Millar <laughs> and, you know, all sorts of different people. We have a little bit of fun. And if we're on the air for three hours and 30 minutes, you know, we're probably talking about the wall for 70 seconds. And we just try and have a little bit of fun. And we bring on guys that played over there. So Josh Lindblom of the Brewers was the MVP of the league last year. He's been on a number of times. He's been an invaluable resource. He's been good on the air. But, you know, we we started learning about this league a week yeah. before they started playing. You didn't have and much so, notice on this. You no. found out at the 11th hour. There's also just an element. I, again, both of you guys could relate on this. But, like, if the Marlins played the Braves tomorrow, you guys could do the game the game at both teams without numbers. Like, if they just wore their uniform, you know the shapes and sizes. Right. You know what I'm saying? There's an autopilot, and, it'll, and that allows you to do so many other things that in this instance, I don't have the luxury of. I've seen these guys so little so that I'm having to really concentrate on, if I'm trying to identify who it is, I really have to get locked in, whereas you don't even realize how you're able to like spin a plate over here because you know everything that's happening on the field because of your familiarity with the Marlins, the Braves, the Nationals, and then you can do something over here and bring up a topic of conversation and what's happening on the field, you just know is happening on the field. So it's, uh, I mean, look, we try and have fun with it. We're not going to, we're not going to, please everyone i just i wish for the people to get cranky about it they i mean you guys both know me well enough i, I like to play i mean let, let's let's smile i mean i i, I want to have some i want to have some fun with it and i think we've had good guests on because we're not experts we're learning but that have told people okay here's some of the insights uh, about the league yeah it's uh well listen i, I guess uh 
A compliment I'd give is they wouldn't put you on the case if they didn't figure that you could do a pretty good job at it. So, um, you know, when you're in your element on Sunday night with Chris Singleton or on, on Wednesday nights, you know, obviously you're uh, you're one of the best uh, around. So if uh, if a few months of KBO baseball is what it takes yeah. to, to kind of keep you fresh for when baseball does start, then that's great. Um, okay. When do you think we'll see Major League Baseball again? Man. I mean, I think it, it's it's somewhere in the July 1st to August 1st ish. So you're hopeful window. that 2020 there will be a baseball season. Yeah, let's I mean, start I still, there. That's good. I still lean in that direction. I do think that the undercovered, underreported part of this scenario is I'm not quite sure why it, the focus is always on the players, but I do think that. One of the parts of this that's not been covered is that it is not equal from an owner's standpoint. If you miss a good chunk of the season and you're not going to play with fans, there's a lot more or less payoff for certain teams. So, so there's more, you know, kind of wrestling and infighting on that owner's side than I think has really been talked about as it relates to, hey, I think that there are guys on the owner's side that would say, yeah, maybe we'd be better off just chucking 2020 because we're going to lose a lot of money. So I'm still hopeful. I think that the league really wants to play, and I I hope that they they figure it out. Yeah, hey, I've got I've got two last Korea questions for you. One of them is from a viewer, uh, all about 30 man on Twitter. Wanted to know besides your previously prope- uh, professed support of ties after 12 innings. Is there anything you've seen in Korean baseball that you think could be applied in the major leagues? Ooh, good question. Uh, that could be applied in the major leagues. Um, I mean, I'm in on Universal DH. It looks like they're probably going to do that. That's that's sort of easy. Um, anything else that could be applied? They, you know what? If we're going to keep the playoff system the way it is, I do kind of like the idea of, I don't know whether you know, but their wild card system. So the, so the four versus the five, the four seed begins up 1-0. Wow. And so the five seed's got to win twice. Wow. Wow. So I think that that's kind of interesting. And the one seed gets the bye all the way to the championship round in Korea. And the thing that's interesting is I think you guys probably are on the same – I think we're conditioned to think, ooh, that may not be a good thing. But for the most part, it has served the one seed well. The, the rest has served the one seed well pitching-wise. Interesting. That's interesting. The, the last thing on Korea for me, uh, with your experience, and this is kind of an inside broadcasting question, now that you're broadcasting games remotely, you got to imagine when Major League Baseball comes back, to some extent, we're all going to be broadcasting remotely, whether it's when our team goes on the yeah. road doing some games from the studio or somewhere. What have you learned about broadcasting remotely that Paul and I might be able to apply? <laughs> Hang on, let me get my pen. Yeah, yeah man. <laughs> I, you know, I, I mean, th- honestly, this is a good question that, um, <laughs> that, I mean, we really should have this talk off the air. I, I, on, I don't think I'm going to travel this year. I, no one said that to me, but if you were to ask, I don't, I don't. That's the I'm conventional gonna, wisdom. So like, I think I'm going to do. I think I'm going to do all my games right, right from here. Um. What would I say something to learn? I, well, okay, so if, if there's something that I could have, I would want some version of like an all-22 right. NFL reference, but I'd want a high home look in some way standard as a, you know, whether if it's a big monitor in one spot, just so I could see where everybody is, that would be one thing. Um I mean, my my tendency and and is do less, do less. Like try and be a little, a little more. So like as much as we have guests on, you know, people. At, but and this is you know more TV. But I, um, we're not rolling packages in. Right. Not, you know, like we're we're it, it's 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 they are non-moving slabs on the side of the broadcast. Keep it simple. So that would be my main thing and then you know Geff I'm going to be doing you know Sundays on the radio my you know my thing is just I'd want a good crowd Mike I'd I'd really be into the timing of the pitch to see if you could I think that that's the most crucial thing is is 
you know, getting getting synced up with what's happening pitcher to catcher just so that you're not chasing the play and that type of thing and that that all 22 or that, you know, broader look mm-hmm. camera I think would be would be pretty crucial. Um, but I, I haven't – I know it'll be – look, it'll be easier for me based on, you know, this one is kind of like doing it with, you know, one arm tied behind your back, and I think that'll be easier just because you'll know the players. But – um, yeah, as it goes on, I, I think I, I feel like I don't have a, a great answer. I just know it'll be a little easier because so many of the things will be a little more familiar. Yeah, and, and I don't know where this ranks in terms of you know what's most difficult of whatever our broadcasts are going to look like. But we are all our job is to talk basically, right, yes. and, and carry the audience through what's going on. But a lot of times the greatest calls in baseball broadcasting history are the ones where no one says anything. And that's because the 40, 50,000 people are carrying that moment. You know, like Vin Scully and Kirk Gibson, you know, he hits the home run. Scully gets up and goes for a cup of coffee, you know, and those moments where... I mean, yeah. you've been trained for years to do that. I'm, you know, working through these things. Geff does it phenomenally. It's like your your quarterback clock, another NFL reference, is going to say, right. I got to say something. Yeah. There's no, there's nothing going on. I So, and I'm interested as well in terms of how does that affect the players? Because I do think there's a chance that it could take the level of play down. That after the excitement of a couple of weeks wears off is it going to feel like a practice to the players mm-hmm. b game so, a spring training yeah, b game right that's right i, I mean so i i think that that's you know that's a, a big part of it not having the boost for us from the crowd for the players from the crowd i'll also say this i'm a guy who has you know interest in analytics i like you know, bringing an analytical bent to things, but I also like telling stories. And so the biggest part for me that's going to be bad, I and, and I put it right there with the crowd, is the lack of interaction with the guys. I think lack especially, you know, when I was with the Braves, I'd go into the clubhouse and I'd stand there and Brian McCann would clean out his locker. He was a slob. <laughs> and so he'd sit there and clean out his locker and then, all of a sudden, he finds this like skull cap, and he's like, "Oh, I've been looking for this for weeks. I haven't been able." And and then I get to tell that story on the air, and it like humanizes Brian McCann. Right. I'm doing the wild card game at Yankee Stadium a couple years ago on radio. Can I curse? Uh, no, it's fine. Oh, you yeah, can. yeah. Uh, sure. Okay. Why not? So and and I and I'm talking You're with first. Brian Cashman, and we're just having a chat and the A's and the Yankees are playing, and Billy Bean comes up, interrupts the conversation. And this is when everybody had really started to realize the Yankees were big on analytics as well. So I guess it was the year before last. But but I'm talking with Cash, and Billy Bean comes up and goes, what's up, Cash? You going to out-analytics the shit out of us tonight? <laughs> and then I, you know, eventually their cool. con- the conversation finishes, and I take Billy aside, and I'm like, can I use that on the air? He's like, absolutely. <laughs> but... You know what I'm saying? Like those yeah. little stories, I die for stuff like that. Just those, those funny things that, uh, you know, it's it's that stuff that brings me. I, Chipper Jones, I want to, you know, so the Chipper Jones story where he's looking up at me is one of the stories. There, I have another Chipper Jones story that I think is almost as good, and that is, and he let me use it. But like it just speaks to the so many things, the clubhouse culture, his relationship with John Smoltz, um, his attitude. He's playing backgammon one day. It was actually it was 2008. It was in Marlins Park. So it's that old clubhouse and they're playing backgammon and Smoltz is kicking his butt. And Chipper starts to come back and he rolls double six after double six after double six (laughs) and eventually comes back and beats him. And then Chipper's like. (laughs) <laughs> and when it's over, I said to him, I said, dude, I, I don't think I've ever seen you that emotional on the field. What's up? And he points at Smoltzy and goes, what can I say? He's my New York Mets. <laughs> <laughs> and then I asked him, can I use that? But you know what I'm saying, guys? Like yeah. It's that stuff day in and day yeah. out. You get to be around these dudes. You share their stories. You hum- humanize them. You, you know, in that instance... A Braves fan smiles, a Mets fan's like, eh. but it's still like that's bringing 
the flavor to the broadcast. And I love I love going in search of that stuff. I love the interaction, the presentation of it. Um, just the humanity of, of explaining to people what these guys are like. I mean, you can see how excited I get just <laughs> telling <laughs> the stories right now. And we're not going to be able to do that. It bums me out. Yeah. When did you know that you wanted to be a play-by-play guy? You know, it's funny. I I was doing games uh, in college. I did, you know, some basketball, some football, but we didn't do baseball because BC wasn't any good, and and so they didn't they weren't on the radio at all. So my first, I, I, baseball is my favorite sport, but I didn't, and I loved Harry Callis, but I I still didn't. Uh, I don't think I had totally put it together until in 94 and 95, I started going to the Marlins games and doing games into a tape recorder. And then eventually I put together a tape that I felt like, okay, I'm going to let some people listen to this. And then I got a job uh, with the Boise Hawks. And then I got, the, you know, my first job, the first four years, I was the pregame postgame radio guy with in-game scores. And each year I did a little bit more play by play. But, man, I wasn't sure I would be good enough necessarily. I just knew that I really liked it. So I, I think that once once I got the Marlins job, I knew it was – you know what? Scratch that. When I knew when I got the Boise job, I knew I wanted to do baseball. I just wasn't sure if I'd be able to, to pull it off. Right. As a guy who spent that time in Boise, I spent five years working at AAA in Rochester, New York – does it tear your heart out to see what may happen in the next year with minor league baseball, with not just communities losing teams, 40 of them it looks like, but broadcasters not getting that opportunity, all the front office people not getting those jobs, all the interns coming out of college not getting that entree into the game? Yeah, it stinks. It's the it's the it's the lifeblood of the sport. It's you know, those it's it's one of those deals that you'll never be able to, you know, the you'll never be able to to prove causation. But those baseball fans in Burlington, Vermont, have in some way a positive effect on the Miami Marlins. You know what I mean? Like right. just mm-hmm. more people liking the sport. So yeah, it makes me sad. I don't. I don't really like to think about it. You know, I, I still, you know, I've gone to a good last five years, eh, more than that, last eight years, I've probably gone to five of the winter meetings. And I love seeing the young broadcasters there and guys and, you know, people that want to give me tapes and listen to them. And I listen to them. I, I, I love that part, that connection, the climb and, and, yeah, it makes me sad, for sure. I'll yeah. speak for myself, and I'm sure I can speak for all three of us. None of us would be here today were it not for the time we spent working in the minor leagues. No question. Yeah. It's as simple as that. No yeah. doubt. And, and, and that's, no doubt. that's the thing. And, and I uh, have probably the least amount of minor league experience, but I will tell you that it's similar to, to Boog, like what he was talking about before, like I only did one summer uh, in independent baseball, but I didn't need any more than that to know that that's where I was going to go. Like my career path right. was a, is non-traditional, I guess, in a sense. Like I did that as an internship. And then after that, I was at ESPN for five years, MLB Network for yep. seven, but always kind of in that baseball world before this opportunity came about. But um, you're, you're right. When you're talking about it from where you sit right now, Boo, to that connection to the youngsters, if I didn't yeah. have those folks above me always helping me out and being those those ears to listen and and voices yeah. of reason or all kinds of stuff, then then I wouldn't be where I'm at right now. Yeah, well, I mean, when I the, the story I love to tell is Dave O'Brien was a big help for me and and kind of a mentor, and he was a Marlins broadcaster when I made the tape in the booth and I gave him the tape to listen to it, and then I would just go out to the ballpark all the time. I went out one day and he said, hey, I listened to the tape. Do you want to sit before the game and talk about it? Sure. So I think he ate dinner and then we met uh, upstairs in uh, in this area. And he held up the tape and he said, you know, I thought this was going to stink. <laughs> and it didn't. And I was like, all right. <laughs> 
It's a good reference. Yeah. I thought this was going to stink. I thought that's <laughs> a great reference. And it didn't stink as much as I thought. Um, all right. right. So, so, so 97 is your first year with the Marlins, yeah. right? And 97, they win a World Series. You figure this is going to be easy. From here on out, it's the next, uh, it's the next dynasty. But no, walking through that 97 season and kind of seeing it, it, it build and it grow uh, to eventually a World Series champion, what do you remember about that year? So the thing I remember the most was just the hype and the spotlight on that team. They, had gone, they were top five payroll team. They'd gone out and spent all that free agent money, and they had an older veteran team. You know, Gary Sheffield, Moise Salou, Bobby Bonilla, Alex Fernandez, Kevin Brown, Al Leiter, Jeff Conine. You know, this was not a young group. Yeah, okay, you had you know, a 20-year-old shortstop uh, in Edgar Renteria, and you had Luis Castillo. But it was, man, it was it was a, a veteran bunch with a veteran manager in Jim Leland. And I would say they felt probably like they underperformed during the year. I, I think that I would say that you, you just, there was just this constant, like Sheffield didn't have a good year that year. And there was just this constant, they're, they're not quite as good as we thought they would be, but they were uber talented. And so it was a weird year. They never really made a race in the East uh, for, you know, for the division. The Braves really had it, had it uh, set. And so, but they handled the Braves that year, didn't they? And they handled really the Braves record? head to head. Yep. Yep. Yeah, that's the thing that was funny, was that they handled the Braves head to head, but they never really got close uh, in a way, so I think I will tell you that I think that because of that, there was confidence in facing the the Braves head to head. And I mean, look, step back and think about it. You had peak Gary Sheffield, peak Moise Salou, peak Bobby Bonilla, Jeff Conine, Darren Dalton. Um, you know, and then you had, you know, until he got hurt, peak Alex Fernandez, peak Al Leiter, peak Kevin Brown. Levon Hernandez as like it was a good team. Robbie yeah. Enns, your closer. I mean, there was it was a talented, talented group. So I, I think that yeah, it was. I mean, people got on the bandwagon and it uh, it was fun. It was a uh, it was a a fun a fun year and just it, it happened so fast. And I I think I connect probably a little more on the 03 team just because I had been there a while. And I think I was just a little more present, you know, with that, the 97 team was great for me because I learned how to travel in the big leagues and I kind of kept my mouth shut and it, you know, it helped me, it helped me a lot. Like what was funny was that I kept my mouth shut and, you know, really, you know, the way you operate in the clubhouse and that type of thing is a young guy. And then they traded everybody and then because I was doing pregame and postgame and I'd go and interview people, you know, everybody gets scattered, you know, off to different teams. And everybody kind of responded well to me when I would see them. So I would right. get to interview all these all these guys after they'd been after they'd been traded. So it was a fun year. And I still can remember I think the thing, you know, game seven was so tense. The thing I remember the most was uh, Renteria's hit, and then going out on the field, going through the dugout, going out onto the field to get to start to grab guys to do interviews in the dugout. And when I got from the dugout to the top of the steps to get out onto the field, the sound that hit me because, hmm. like, they were still celebrating on the field. I mean, it was, you know, probably inside of a minute from the final out, and the sound was like, whoa. <laughs> so, yeah, the wall of sound. Everybody talks about 97 and 2003. What did it feel like from your standpoint being there in 1998 through 2002 and having the, the rug ripped out from under you after 97 and then slowly watching this thing build up again? Yeah, 98 was rough, man. And, you know, if you look at it from a standpoint of, I, I do, you know, there, it's, a, it's a confusing market. I, I, I will say... You know, if you compare Colorado and Miami, one of the things that's interesting is if you look at attendance 
to start the first year, and then you look at what attendance did post-strike, it came back in Colorado in a way that it didn't in Miami. Not that it didn't come back at all, but it didn't come back to the same to the same level post strike in Miami. I think Wayne Izenga probably had something to do with that. He was definitely a you know a guy who was trying to break the union. I think that played in at least a little bit. Um, yeah, and I I, I guess uh, that you know those years you saw guys getting better. Um, I think it's a good example of just of how player growth isn't necessarily going to be linear. You know, I, I think of that time. Everybody assumes that if a scout said this guy's going to hit 30 home runs, that the way he's going to hit 30 home runs is that his first year he's going to hit 16, and then his second year he's going to hit 19, and then his third year he's going to hit 22, and then it just goes like this. And Derek Lee's a guy that comes to mind that people were always frustrated with because it didn't just happen. And Derek was a guy whose body la- – he was flat – you know, he, he – he wasn't a snapper. So like Mike Lowell would strike out and throw his helmet and Derek would just put his helmet and his back down. And I asked Derek about it one time and I said, you know, how come you don't snap? And he said to me, and it's an indi- I love Derek and it, and Mikey, it's an indication of, yeah, just the mindset and everybody's wired differently. And it doesn't mean Derek cared less, but I said to Derek one time, how come you don't snap? Now this has got to be 1999. And he said to me, um, the reason I don't snap is because the first thought in my head is that my mom would call me after the game and she would say to me, what's that childish behavior going to do for your performance? Yeah. it's a great answer. Yeah. It's, uh, okay. that, that's, that's, that, and again, you're right. Everybody, everybody is different and yeah. they can't be faulted for that. Yeah, you that's know, right. And, and it helps in a team dynamic. You know, I, I grew up watching a lot of the Yankees, right? Like yep. Derek Jeter, right? Owner of the yep. Marlins now, like was usually, I think he got thrown out of maybe one game his whole career. And yet he right. played with Paul O'Neill. And, yep. it, and it all kind of meshes together. And that's how you get that team point. dynamic. That's right. If you have 25 guys with all the same personality, it's probably not a good thing. Yeah. Yep. Um, all right. So then 03. Let's yeah. move to 03. So uh, we kind of we, we brought you on. Glenn's uh, question of the day was was uh, about Game Four and the home run. Right. Um, as your, I guess you could take a step back even before that was the NLCS. There was a moment or two that kind of stood out, right? Where were you in in seeing the the Bartman play? I guess we could start in yeah. Game Six. I mean, that was a, th- that whole thing was like a magic carpet ride. You know, the the it was a talented team that underperformed. I think, roughly speaking, they were like ninth in runs per game and eighth in ERA. I mean, it, you don't see too many teams win it. But there was talent. You know, there's no question there was talent. Um, the Bartman play, Dave Van Horn had the call. I was next to him. I, You know, in the moment, I don't think you really understood what was happening. So, like, to me and on the broadcast, I think of Alex Gonzalez's error as being the the bigger thing. The other Alex um, Gonzalez. The other Alex Gonzalez. That's right. <laughs> Chicago's Alex Gonzalez. The, the, Mi- the Miami Alex Gonzalez. Right. He grew up in, Miami. Up in, in Miami. And uh, yeah, I, I just, it was amazing to see, you know, they were five, the Cubs were five outs away from the, the World Series. It was a 3 1 game. And I that team was so interesting in terms of. There was a bond there. They got Jeff Conine late in the season. Conine did this thing. This will stun you guys. But, like, for 7 o'clock games on the road at times, Jeff would take the bus. And, I mean, nobody does. And we got to this. And, and the mindset was effectively this. No one was going to the field to go to play. Not no one. But his mindset was, when I get to the field... It's time to work. So there's no, like, let's show up at the field early and go eat and play cards. Right. Once we get to the office, it's time to go to work. And it turned this thing, I can still remember, going to playoff games at Wrigley Field, and half the team's on the bus, on the bus to a playoff game, like for a night game. It's crazy. And Mike Redmond's making everybody laugh. We're going to the World Series taking the bus, not an early bus, like just taking the bus. 
and seeing how many people would flip off the bus on the way to the Bronx <laughs> going to Yankee Stadium for the World Series. Um, yeah, it, it was – the Giant Series was pretty incredible. And, you know, you just – you felt like you had a little bit of a, a rabbit's foot. You know, Mike Lowell hurt his hand, so he didn't play. And then he came off the bench – and hit a big home run in game one of the LCS. And then the story that I like telling that I think is is cool is my version of the Aaron Boone home run. And that is the NLCS ended a day before the ALCS. And that was the first year that home field was determined by the All-Star game. Right. The American League won it. So American League had home field. So we didn't know where we were going. So we're at the Westin. The whole team is in two conference rooms or two ballrooms watching the Yankees and the Red Sox. The Red Sox are leading the whole way. It starts to get to the late stages. And now Bill Beck's like, okay, everybody, we're going to go get on the bus. <laughs> so now we got to go get on the bus and, and boomer. So we got three buses. And now we're driving. The Yankees tie it up. They leave, you know, Grady lives Pedro in too long. And now we get to the airport. There. We're not allowed to get on the plane. We're not allowed to get on the plane because we don't have a destination. <laughs> and so it's three buses outside the gate entrance to the charter. And we can see the plane. <laughs> we can see the stairs to the plane. And literally, it's Aaron Boone, and we're listening to John Miller, and it's Aaron Boone. Swung on belted deep left field, and the Yankees have won the pen. And the gate is opening, and we drive onto the tarmac and get on the plane. I mean, like, I think he's finishing his call, and we're driving. But we're sitting, we couldn't go anywhere because we didn't know where we were going, and they wouldn't let us get on the plane without a destination set. Wow. Was this still Manny? Was this Manny Cologne at the helm? At, the, at, uh, at that time, back. that was the. Oh, that's right. That's what you just back. said. That's yeah. right. I thought that's Manny was there for about time. twenty years. But yeah, that's yeah. All right. Marlins traveling secretary. That's right. That's I know right. Manny though. Yeah. Yeah, Manny's yeah. a good guy. But yeah, th again, those are those little things, um, those little travel nuggets, right? That that I guess yeah. at this point you're you you have your own little travel issues, I'm sure, um, and we can get into that in just a second. Um, so then, time with the Braves. Braves yep. from 07 to 09. Uh, I'm sure you no had. Playoff. No playoffs. Yeah, that was like the one three-year window, right? Or something like yep, that, four or five-year right. window. Good job. Well, hey, you had two World Series championships in yeah. Miami, so quit complaining. Yeah. Uh, but, but you did see Chipper. You did see John Smoltz toward the end of his Atlanta career. You actually saw the return of Tom Glavin as well. So even though um, it wasn't that run of, what, 14 straight division titles, there was still those bits of that history and that feel. What do you remember yeah. of your time in Atlanta? Yeah, I, th I mean, again, you you know, we were on the other side for eight years, and then you, you get in there, and the part, again, you guys can relate to this. You play them so many darn times, I, I felt comfortable with all of them. They, you know, they, they knew who I was. And then also, it was like a peek behind the curtain. You know, you got a chance to to really get to know these guys, and they were fun. Now, this was kind of the, the beginning of the baby Braves, Frank Corr right. and McCann and Kelly Johnson and those guys. Um but getting to talk baseball with Chipper and John a lot, you know, and I got to meet David Ross then. And like I said, Brian McCann and Jeff Francoeur just starting their careers, and they were great dudes. Uh, it was fun. It was it was neat. And Bobby Cox was always awesome to me. It was uh, it was a great experience. I, I and they have a, they have a I mean they get a bad rap, but they get a passionate fan base they really they, they have a passionate fan base and I enjoyed my time there I really did it's still you know it there's still a connection to to Atlanta for me there's no doubt yeah you had Leland here in 97 yeah. you had Jack here in 03 you mentioned your years with Bobby Cox in Atlanta yeah. three iconic managers is there a link among those three um ooh, that's a good question I mean I think that that they they were both i mean they were all three of them were pretty nuanced i mean jack you know jack in 03 um you know there were times where it was you know jack first got there and it was an out of the box hire it was actually a bill beck suggestion and you know hey you know get the lefty up well, do you want Almanza or Alvarez? I don't care. Like, <laughs> just get one of them up. And Leland was, 
for you know for me the Jim Leland part of it was going from ninety seven to to ninety eight and just um the way he interacted with guys I mean it, all of the it's it, it's all R rated I can't do any <laughs> any of the Jim Leland stuff but yeah I mean all three guys had the respect of the players I would say especially with Bobby and Jim. They really knew how to manipulate when they needed it. They would wait for their spots. They weren't active in the clubhouse. Um, you really only felt their presence when necessary, and they were they were great at it. I mean, all three guys were 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 pretty special in that regard. So after the Braves '09 ends, uh, you kind of jump on with ESPN, and uh, yeah. I don't have to go through everything here. I know we're already coming up on about 50 minutes here with you, and we appreciate the time. But um, so, all right. So you, I don't know if it's your your main thing, but I guess we'll start there. Sunday night baseball, right? Sunday that's, night baseball. I mean, that's how I came back. Right. I came back for that job. I came back. Right. To, I mean, I was doing basketball in all three off seasons, seven, eight, and nine for ESPN. So my winters were spent still working for ESPN. Sure. And even seven, eight, and nine, I probably did a TV game or two and a radio game or two for ESPN. But I came back uh, to take over as the voice of, of Major League Baseball and ESPN radio. And that was, yeah, that was my gig. And that was something that I wanted. I think the other thing, if I were to be totally honest with you guys, the other part was... Um, I'm a New York kid. I wanted to get back to New York. I knew that if I had if I had that gig, I could live wherever I wanted, and I wanted to live back in New York City. Right. Uh, so this, in terms of Sunday night, for example, right, because you had all these years with the team, uh, yeah. a lot of times your team, you you do that prep by osmosis. You know, you're, yeah. you may not be spending seven, eight hours on a computer in the morning reading all the articles right. because you're hearing the quotes from the manager the day before. Like, you're, you just kind of get it. But you are still obviously prepping for the other team. How does the prep change from team broadcaster to national broadcaster? So I I think that my sensibility as a team broadcaster was probably always a little more towards national broadcaster. Meaning if I found interesting stuff on the other team, I probably was going to try and get some interesting stuff about the the other team. I I think, look, the, the biggest change... Well, there are a couple of things. Number one, let's be honest. I'm a national guy and I parachute in. I don't do all 30 teams. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I there's like 17 teams that I do actively a ton. And so I'm pretty well schooled on those, on those teams. And after a while, you know, I've seen the Yankees, the Red Sox, the Dodgers, the Cardinals, the Brewers, the Cubs. The Indians, the Astros, you know, the, those are the teams. And so, for the most part, that's, you know, if you look at, I mean, read out what the what the Sunday night schedule is going to be. You know, Wednesday is a little different, but in terms of Sunday night, it, it's the grouping of teams is is smaller. What I I would never trade my path. I loved it. I'm glad that I got eight years. Because as much as I love the Bill James stuff and the analytics stuff, and it's it's how my brain works, I like telling stories, and baseball people have and continue to be a huge influence for me. So, like, one of the things that really helped me in 97 was before the season started, the pitching coach was Larry Rothschild. And all those guys knew that I was a big baseball guy, that I loved it. And Larry said to me, whatever you need, you just tell me. And I would sit next to Larry on the plane. And this is back in the day of, like, portable VCRs. Mm. And he would go over video with a scouting report, and I'd just ask him questions. And he'd let me ask him questions just to learn. And scouts were, you know, more prevalent in the press box then and they, I mean they're still there, but I but like you, you know less teams travel scouts so on and so forth. Um, so I just I learned and then the way I I would say that I go about doing it now, um, I guess more than anything from a preparation standpoint, I build like kind of so the way I prepare for a game is if I'm doing. This is how I'll do it. Is if if I did the Marlins and the Braves, I'd start with the Marlins and I'd and I'd say, okay, let's look at the Marlins' offense. 
then I'd say, is this a good offense? Okay, where do they rank in the National League in runs per game, in on base, in slugging, in home run rate? Where do they rank in ERA, in starters ERA, in bullpen ERA? Where do they rank in DRS? Where do they rank in efficiency? So I get all those, and now, so now I'm looking at, okay, it's they're good at this, not as good at this, and th- that's my starting point every time I prepare for a broadcast with a team. And then you get into the pitcher and you get into some of the other stuff. And if one of those things are extreme, um, I probably will go down that rabbit hole as well. A lot of times I'll, I'll call guys, but I cut myself off. I, so I love that I got to travel with a team and just understand the way players think, because I don't, I don't think that everything analytically can be applied in real time. They're humans. And so I'm glad that I got a window into that. And then I like what my gig is now. Like, I think that the one, the the one thing I'm glad I did it, but the one thing I like compared to your guys gig is I, I don't want it to feel like time to make the donuts. Right. And so you got Braves and Marlins four straight days. By the by, the fourth day, you're gonna have to go find something, or at least it's gonna go. Fe- like I understand it. Like don't miss it. But I love that I I do it once, and I am unloading my back. Right. I mean, I you know I'm not gonna I, I, not to the detriment of the broadcast, but it feels fresher. That's what that's the thing that that's that I love. That's exciting, and then I'm out. Right. You know what I mean? So, but I but I. But I wouldn't trade it. Like, I don't know that I would say that this is what I like or that I enjoy this this much if I hadn't done it every day for eight years with the Marlins and 130 with the Braves. Like, I wouldn't trade that part of it. If, if I, I think in order to do this, I, I had to do that. And it, it was just crucial. Well, uh, you talked about analytics. You've mentioned analytics a few times. Yeah. I would suggest among team voices and among national play-by-play voices – you're probably the most analytically inclined play-by-play broadcaster there is out there. And again, you don't overwhelm people with analytics. You talk about the importance of the anecdotal stuff. Okay. But but where is that balance with yeah. analytics on a broadcast? And TV and radio are two different animals. I know yeah. in, in doing things on radio where you don't have the picture, where you have less time between pitches, where do you strike that balance? Yeah, so... I- so start on the radio side. I mean, my goal on the radio side is timing and nailing the play. I mean, it's 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 about describing the action, painting the picture. That's the number one responsibility. And if I can get the other stuff in there, I will. But the priority is that. On TV, what's fun is you can get into to some of that content. Look, you know, one of the things with what we do Whatever the producer thinks, it's our little secret. So it's like we're huddling up right here. But whatever the producer <laughs> thinks, whatever the analyst thinks, we're the editor. Like, really, the content that's taking place, we control. Mm-hmm. The play-by-play guy controls it. Like, whatever you want to say. Right. Like, there are pictures, but we're the point guard. We control the content. So in terms of analytics, the first place I, I, that I'm trying to go is – Interesting is interesting, man. And, you know, I always make this point on Bill James defined Saber metrics. And it, the definition is the search for objective knowledge about baseball. Who's against that? Who's against that? So, you know, in the end, you know, it, it's it can be something as simple as, well, I think Ryan Braun's going to struggle this year because he doesn't have Prince Fielder behind him. And then Prince Fielder is gone, and I give you, you know, Ryan Braun this year is actually saying seeing the same amount of fastballs by percentage and actually uh, a higher percentage of strikes. You know, like that same numbers metrics, are what they man. are. And that's yeah. in analytics. It's just it's good data. So I'm not trying to turn it into. I think what ends up happening is, man, I'm not going on the air and trying to break down the formula for Wobo. I'm just not doing it. <laughs> Nobody now, wants I to might hear that. mention that on base and slugging are the two stats that correlate the most with run scoring. Like that's just prep. It's just fact. Okay. 
on base and slugging are the two stats that correlate the most. Like, it's not like, yeah, like RBIs. No, it's on base and it's slugging. Those are the two stats. Okay. And then every once in a while, what you do is I'll say this guy's OBP is 384. The league average is 327. This guy's slugging 600. That's a monster. The league average is 425. Right. Content. And like, you've yep, done a little the something right there. Yep. I'm not, yep. you know, and I'm not. I'm not going to try and get into like weighted runs created or or stuff, you know, quite like that. I, I may throw it in there from time to time. I'd also say this: you do need to remember, also, especially for you guys, when you know your fans are your fans. You can make them drink the sand. I mean, like, if both of you guys made a commitment to never mention pitcher wins the rest of the year. Like the, the, this whole season, if you made a, com- I'm not, whatever. But my point is this. If you made a commitment, you never mentioned pitcher wins the entire year. I don't think you'd lose a single viewer and you'd make them smarter. Right. So like, you know what I'm saying? So I, I'm not trying, I don't want to turn it into math. I want to make interesting points. I want people to learn stuff. Mm-hmm. If I say what the context is in terms of league averages, um, you know, all the time. If I sit there and tell you, you know, like one of the things I thought was so interesting, uh, not last year, but two years ago, I think this is correct. And if anybody wants, I'm I'm almost positive. 2018, I'm pretty sure that the top eight teams in pitching, the top eight in strikeout percentage all made the playoffs. Like, so the point being, you want to have good pitching staff. You want to be elite. You got to strike people out. Right. Stuff like that. You know what I'm saying? Like, so yeah. it's 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 like trying to take the data and the information and make points, and you're doing it utilizing strikeout percentage and maybe some other stuff that's a little off kilter and and telling people some stuff they may not know. It helps tell the story. Right. right. And that's I, right. And I think the other part of it too is that you know a lot of folks will sit there and say, oh, geez, you. you all you do is watch baseball for a living. Yeah, that's true. And we talk about baseball, but there is, and again, I don't consider myself a master at it by any stretch of the imagination, but there is also a nuance to how you do it. Like, yes, the three of us have access to fan graphs and who's ever watching at home has access to fan graphs, but the nuance of the art of what we do, and some do it better than others, is how do you then deploy that information in a way that informs the viewer without talking down to a viewer who may not understand it at the same level you do. And I'm going to jump in here and say that, Boog, is one of your great strengths. Correct. And I've said in the past, analytics needs more voices like Boog Shambi who don't condescend, who, who don't, whether it, it's from their basement, tell you they're smarter than the general manager or from a TV office. studio somewhere. <laughs> well, but, but, but seriously, there's value to all this yeah. stuff. There's huge merit. But analytics needs more voices like yours. I, that's really kind of you guys. Um, I, you know, I, look, I, I definitely, I want to come at these things with an open mind. Um, I, I will tell you that I think that you guys can relate on this one. The 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 place I thought that you were going to go is whether it's analytics or not. Man, you got a good piece of information how you do it is important in terms of there just may not be space and every and 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 it's not easy to resist that i had this great thing in my pocket and like we there's two outs and two strikes and i really want to throw it out there and look i'm still sometimes i do and sometimes i don't sometimes i make good choices and sometimes i mean i I, i'm better at it now than i was 10 years ago but um you got to resist it sometimes for, I mean, how you do it takes on a lot of different forms, but I'm with you. I, I want to, like, I want to be playful. I want to make it clear that I don't know everything. I'm open to all perspectives. Um, yeah. And try my best. I, I look in the world, right? Uh, let's not go down, but tone is so important. I mean, I think tone's always been important, but tone's really really important i mean we're, we're living in a time where if you tell someone two plus two equals four with bad tone we're living in an age where they might want to debate you right yeah 
Yeah, you got to. You certainly have to be careful with that. Uh, I, I want to get to. Uh, we have our, our hit and run segment, which is coming up in just a second here. Okay. Um, but I notice your hat. I notice yes. your hat, and I know that you're an advocate for those with ALS. Um, yeah. Where did that all start, and where are we at with uh, with Project Main Street? Thank you. Yeah. Um, I so I grew up in in Philadelphia. I was a huge baseball fan. Um, and we moved to New York when I was seven and I'm buddy she and we were friends until he passed from ALS in 2007. That was my first year with the Braves and he was diagnosed in 2005 and in 2006 we started Project Main Street where I grew in New York, grew up in New York City is Roosevelt Island. There's one street it's called Main Street. Tim named it. We raise money to advocate and help for, help people that live with the disease so it's not for research not we're not anti-research by any stretch it's just that there's so much that isn't covered by healthcare, and the cost is incredible as condition declines cost goes up and so we raised money we're a 501c3 we started it back in 06 tim played college soccer with one of the guys from hootie and the blowfish and they played our first event. We raised a whole bunch of money. We gave half to Kim and or Tim and Katie. And then the other half, we started our 501c3. We were supposed to have our event this past Wednesday. Unfortunately, it was canceled. I'm working on, I, I have collected a bunch of really cool auction items. And I'm working on trying to do some type of online auction. Um, I haven't quite sorted it out yet just because, you know, our charity is applicable in light of you know all the problems with COVID and the economic impact because there are plenty of people that because of the economic impact there are things that they can't afford now because of care or an extra caregiver or whatever because you know somebody is now unemployed or something along those lines so we're trying to figure out a way to to raise some money but that's that's kind of the nuts and bolts of it and, and inside the league I've tried you know to I mean so our charity is to help those living with ALS. I'm down to help anybody in the ALS space. Uh, last off season, they did a, at the winter meetings, they did a, an auction for Major League Baseball, raised I think $300,000 in, in over a two day span, which was pretty incredible. And I would love someday, I think my fantasy, if there, the one thing I threw out, I'd love there to be a Lou Gehrig day. I'd love there to be an ALS day. Now, the speech took place on the 4th of July. It's not going to be on the 4th of July because of obvious reasons. But I would love it if, you know, over the course of a, a season, probably in May, that would be my fantasy to to do. Uh, you know, there's this great logo. Hang on one second. I'll show you guys this. You know, they have this that they, that they made. Um, okay, right, right. If you can see it, yeah. So... Very anyway, nice. Very nice. I, yeah, I just I'd love to I'd love to uh, to see Major League Baseball have a you know an ALS day just for awareness because so many people uh, don't know about it and it's still unfortunate it's a hundred percent fatal still. So. Yeah. Uh, well, listen. It, May se May second thirty nine was the day Garrett took himself out of the lineup, ending the streak. Okay. May is ALS Awareness Month. That okay. would be the time. You have a website, Boog, for anybody who wants to learn more. Yep. What's the website? ProjectMainStreet.org, and you can donate there. It's tax deductible, five dollars, ten dollars, any any amount helps. So I appreciate that, you guys. Thank Very you. Well. Absolutely. Thank you. Keep up the uh, the terrific work. Uh, all right, time for our uh, our hit and run. So some quick yes. hitting questions, and then we let you run. Um, if you weren't a broadcaster, what would you be doing for a living? Man. Somebody asked this to me recently. I feel like there's been a gap in getting asked this question. <laughs> I used to say, like, I, I think I'd be doing something in baseball. I, I do. I, I, I'd be doing some. I'm not smart enough to be in a, a front office in, in today's world, but I'd be doing something in baseball, I think. I think 15 years ago, my answer would have been lawyer uh, because I'm a gas bag and I'm opinionated. <laughs> but I... I I don't know something in baseball, but I, it's a good question, Paul. Because I, I like people used to ask me that question, and I ha and I felt like yeah, I have a good answer. And now it's it's I've been doing it for so long. I'm like yeah, I don't, I don't know. So. <laughs> right? Yeah, I I have no idea either. I'm not qualified for anything else. Um, uh, what advice would you give a young twenties John Shambi? Um. I guess be patient. 
I think I guess that's that's part of it. It's you know, it's like you want to keep moving forward, but you have to you have to be patient and and hopefully your behavior follows as it relates to to being patient. I think there are times when I probably was, you know, overly aggressive trying to, to get on the air and and frustrated, et cetera. But I think be patient. Yeah. Who amongst us has not been frustrated at times? Yeah, I, uh, yeah. I'm with you there. Uh, all time baseball moment that you wish you were on the mic for. All-time baseball moment that I wish I was on the mic for. Um, man, that's a really good question. I, I will tell you this: that like, like I don't begrudge it. I but I, yeah. The, I, my favorite. I grew up a big '80s Phillies fan, but. That 03 Marlins team with those guys, like the final out of the, I, I wish I could, I could have my own call of that just because that team, that team means so much to me. That 03 Marlins team means so much to me. I love those guys. Those guys, I feel so connected to the guys on that team. So I, I think that it, it's, it's, that's. I mean, the 80 Phillies, I love Mike Schmidt, but I, the 03 Marlins is probably my favorite team ever. Okay. Uh, the thing you miss the most about being a team broadcaster? Just the, the connection that you get and, and being in the bubble, as I like to call it, on a day-in, day-out basis. Some, some type of funny conversation on a team plane or the type of relationships that you establish. I mean, look, in the end, it's it, it's it, those type of relationships. Like, I have uh, – here, can I take my, my headset off again? Yeah, go, show go you right this. ahead. All right, hang on one second. So look at this. So, all right. Stand by. <laughs> so, like, here's what I miss. You ready? So, 1999, I, you know, settled in a bit. And I went up to Derek Lee and I said, you know, D, they talked about that you were going to be uh, you were going to go to North Carolina and you were going to play basketball and baseball. And he's like, yeah. And I looked at him. Now, at this point, you know, I've been there for a little bit and I know Derek and I'm like. Were you going to play or were you going to be one of those dudes that was going to like wave a towel like with no name on the back of your jersey? <laughs> And he just, he does this one to me. <laughs> <laughs> so now this is even better. Carolina is playing Gonzaga in the national championship a couple years ago. And my phone beeps. Can you see this picture of Derek Lee in full North Carolina gear? <laughs> oh, yeah. And he's I think, I think you got a little bit of a blur <laughs> on the <laughs> Skype, so I can't see, but he's waving a towel. Oh, oh. oh he's, I, all right, I'll text it to you. <laughs> it's a little blurry, but. We but, like, he's waving a towel. He's like, yeah, here I am, <laughs> waving the towel for North Carolina. So, anyway, it just, uh, yeah, it, it's that connection with the, with those guys that's just so much fun. And lastly, what's the thing you miss the least about being a team broadcaster? 4 a.m. getting into Pittsburgh. <laughs> It's always the travel. Right <laughs> yeah. Hey, before we let Boo go, I've got two more that he's uniquely qualified, I think, to answer. we got to ask him. You not only worked for the Marlins between 97 and 2004, you did talk radio in this market yeah. for a long time. You know Miami. You know South Florida. With now your national perspective as well, what do you see when you look to the future of Major League Baseball in Miami? I'm not sure. I'm not I'm not sure. I don't know. I I don't know, man. I really don't. I, I I'll tell you this. They're gonna have to be good. Like the way, the, if if there's a happy ending for the future of baseball in South Florida, the process. I, I am confident in saying this. The process is the team will be really good for an extended stretch, and then the fans will follow. It ain't gonna be the reverse. Mm -hmm. It's not. Right. Um, so I, I don't know, man. I don't know if there's I don't know if there's enough passion for the sport down there. You know, I also you know I always struggle with people talking about there's so much to do, like everybody's out windsurfing or something. I don't <laughs> I don't know that I buy into that one, you know? So I don't know, man. I, I I'm not I'm not sure. 
Yeah. I want it to be great. I will tell you that. Mm-hmm. That's a good, honest answer. And lastly, you mentioned earlier you've done some college basketball. You did some games with Bill Walton. And again, broadcaster yeah. nerd type question. Working with Bill Walton, how did yeah. you survive that? <laughs> Working with Bill Walton, here's my metaphor. So I, so we, we talked about doing Korean baseball is like log rolling, juggling chainsaws. Working with Bill Walton is like one of those driver's egg cars. <laughs> and he has a steering wheel and a gas pedal also. And all of a sudden, he decides that he's going to start driving and he's driving. And then he stops driving and you're like, oh, oh now? Oh, okay. And so it's just, it's just different, you know, but I mean, look, he's just, he's all over the place at one point in one of the broadcasts. I mean, it's not like, I don't struggle to come up with zingers on my own, but at one point, you know, he said, you remember what Eleanor Roosevelt said, right, John? No, Bill, what did she say? (laughs) She said, you should do something scary every day of your life. And I said, and I'm right in the middle of mine. That's, uh, Maui. that's fantastic. Maui uh, you got a trip to Maui out of the deal. <laughs> that's right. I won. I you won. win. You win. Uh, all right, Great John. Time. Listen, man, we appreciate it. This was fantastic. Uh, really Absolutely. appreciate the time. Thanks, you guys. Thank Thanks you. for having me. It's really nice of you to have me. It's great to see your faces. Absolutely. Hopefully we'll see you at a ballpark soon, yeah. one of these yeah. days. Yeah, yeah. All right. Take care. Very good. Thanks, Boog. Boog Shambi, we appreciate it. Uh, again, Geff, one of uh, one of the guys that – one of the thrills for, for me uh, is when we actually get uh, – we get to a city, or we get home from a city, I should say, um, on a Sunday – we get our bags, we get on the bus and everything else, and then we get we head home, and it's 9.30, and I'm listening to Boog and, and Singy uh, on Sunday Night Baseball. I love that. He's one of the best in the business, no question about that. You know, one time a couple of years ago, there was talk he might move to Sunday Night TV, and he's been on radio since 2010. Uh, if he were on TV, that would be a great thing, too, but I love him on the radio. Marlins fans listen to him for a long time in this market, so he's got those Miami roots. He's got a great perspective yeah. on the game. Locally, nationally, now globally, thanks to his work in Korea. <laughs> we could have gone for another hour. Oh, I know there we could. so much more I wanted to get into with him that we didn't get to. I but, know. Uh, maybe there'll be another chance. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and for those that may have missed it at all, uh, you can check it. It's going to be on uh, YouTube, of course, at Archives there, on Periscope. Uh, we're branching into the podcast stuff as well, uh, as Glenn mentioned. So we're just waiting on Apple to give us the green light there. Um, but we do have uh, one more thing, Geff, and that is the uh, a revisit of our question of the day today, which, uh, again, revolved yeah. around our guest, Boog Shambi. Boog had the call when Alex Gonzalez hit the walk-off home run to beat the Yankees in Game 4 of the 2003 World Series, tying that series up at two games apiece. I asked, outside of a World Series clinching moment, two very dramatic ones in Marlins history, what's your all-time favorite moment in Marlins history and that Gonzalez home run got a lot of support it wasn't a poll so people just fired off their various responses I think the Gonzalez walk-off home run in game four and 03 12th inning got more votes than anything uh there was some support for Jose Fernandez's final start in 2016 uh, which at the moment you didn't know the significance it was a great game and it was a very emotional moment when he left the mound. You didn't know you'd never see him pitch again. Right. Uh, support for no hitters by Edinson Volquez, by <clears throat> Kevin Brown, by Henderson Alvarez in the last day of the season. Giancarlo's walk-off grand slam to beat the Mets on Mother's Day 2012 got several votes. A lot of people supporting the first pitch in franchise history, Charlie Huff, in 1993. So no shortage of exciting moments. Hopefully we'll have some more coming your way soon. Right. Uh, and on the flip side, today's actually the 10-year anniversary of Roy Halladay's perfect game against the Marlins, but uh, obviously the uh, the Hall of Famer, unfortunately no longer with us, Roy Halladay, uh, had had a great moment on this day uh, as well at the hands of the Marlins, unfortunately. Um, football save. That was one of those games, even though you were on the wrong side of, you couldn't help but uh, appreciate what Halladay was doing that night. And it was actually an unbelievable game. The Phillies won it one nothing. Josh Johnson was just about as perfect as Halladay was in that game, but Cameron Mabin misplayed a fly ball in center field, allowed the only run of the day to score – Phillies won it one nothing, and, and I'll tell you this, Paul, about that Saturday night. Uh, we have three kids. Our youngest was about a year old at that time. So my wife was at the game with the three kids, including the one-year-old, and she sent me a text in the fourth or fifth inning and said, Caroline's getting antsy. I think i got to go home. i got to leave early. <laughs> and I said, if you leave this ballpark tonight, you're going to miss baseball history because you could feel right. in the fourth or fifth inning 
just how magical Halliday was that night. Yeah, for a run of years there, it, it, he he was similar to a Max Scherzer to uh, to a Clayton Kershaw in the sense that when they're on, you can tell from pitch one and just about any fifth day, you know that they could no hit the opposition or or in that case, ten years ago today, uh, a perfect game. One more reminder to Marlins fans: earn rewards points for every donation made to home plate meals. Home Run Rewards card holders enter the bonus code IMPACT, I-M-P-A-C-T, to earn rewards points and head to marlins.com slash impact to make a difference. Uh, again, our thanks to John Shambi for uh, for taking the time. Uh, again, so much more meat on the bone with him, so uh, perhaps there will be a, a, a John Shambi Part 2 coming up. We'll see. We'll see. And it'll be up as a podcast before too long. And again, we'll be on Apple maybe any hour, certainly any day. I know that's where most people get their podcasts. But if you're on Google Podcasts or Stitcher or Spotify right now, you can just go on and search for 7GEF and you'll find the brand new 7GEF podcast. And every episode we've done of this show so far, the interview portion is now available via podcast. We hope you'll check them out. We have the best interns in <laughs> streaming they long and hard internet video shows they best long interns and hard. yeah yep. uh all right Geff, it has been a pleasure enjoy the weekend hopefully the next time we're with you we uh we have some we have some good news about a 2020 season we'll all keep our fingers crossed but uh Geff, enjoy the weekend buddy great stuff thanks paul all right we'll see you next time folks